So hello and welcome to Rocky River Church Online. Rocky River, it's, uh, it's great to connect with you guys today. And uh, if you happen to be connecting with us today for the very first time, uh, or we just haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Jimmy Britt. I'm the lead pastor here at Rocky River Church. And uh, whether you're a longtime member or regular attender, or today's your first Sunday with us, uh, we're just glad that you're here. So welcome. Uh, just a couple of things before we move into um, a song from Rocky River Church and our worship team and then the message. Um, I want to encourage you that if you're watching this from one of our social media platforms, if, if you would right now, just go over to rockyriverchurch.com and I promise you the message will we'll be right here when you move over. And, and the reason is Facebook Live and uh, you know the other social media platforms, they're fantastic, but it's just really a better experience if you go to rockyriverchurch.com because at rockyriverchurch.com, you can uh, click on message notes, you can shoot us prayer requests, there's online chat that you can you know, um, be involved in. It's just a better interactive experience. And let me encourage you that as soon as you get there, download the message notes. And then the other thing I want to say to you is uh, I want to give you an update on when we're going to start meeting back on our ministry campus here at Rocky River Church. Uh, we, we've moved this up. Uh, we've been looking at mid-July and uh, just to, just to say it this way, um, I've spent a lot of time the last week or so praying about this. Uh, Karen and I both have. Uh, our staff team and other leaders have been praying about it as well. And I just feel like that start date is June the 14th. So uh, in just two weeks from today, we're going to be offering two Sunday morning services right here uh, on our ministry campus. Let me say just a couple of things about this, and, and then we'll get into today's service. But uh, we're going to offer two Sunday morning services, one at 9, and the 1030 service, we're going to move that to 11 a.m. So we're going to have two Sunday morning services, 9 and 11 and moving that second service just gives us a little extra time so that we can clean restrooms and hard surfaces and, you know, do Lysol all in this area and just other things that it takes to, to reset between the first and second service. It just gives us more time. And uh, so January, I'm, I'm sorry, June the 14th, two Sunday services, 9 and 11 a.m. And I'm sure that you're going to have some questions about different things. We're going to answer uh, a lot of those questions this week. We're going to start emailing you. We're going to have a couple of videos out that gives even further explanation about do's and don'ts and things to expect. But when we start on June the 14th with both services, we're going to offer, you know, all of our Sunday morning ministry activities. So kids programs, student programs, restrooms will be open, all of those kinds of things. And, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a few things that are different, like we probably won't be handing bulletins out and stuff like that. That, that printed material will be here, but you'll have to pick those kind of things up and we'll practice physical distancing and all those kinds of things. I want you to know that we're going to do everything that we you know, reasonably can do to make sure that people are safe. That's important to me. I know it's important to you. Now, uh, some of you uh, are, are not ready to come to Sunday morning services. Maybe you just don't feel like it's safe or, uh, you know, at Rocky River Church, we have quite a few seniors. And so maybe you're in the age bracket that seems to be most vulnerable to uh, the coronavirus uh, that, that's okay. We're going to continue to offer Rocky River Church online until, I mean, we're right now as a, as a church staff, we're just planning to continue offering Rocky River Church online, maybe from, from now on. But my point is you, you can come here and worship live with us in person, or you can worship with us, you know, virtually live through Rocky River Church online at rockyriverchurch.com, just like you have for the last several weeks. And, and I want you to know that as a, as a leader, 
you're, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy. You, you're not going to be able to say things that, you know, makes everybody feel good about a decision. And sometimes in leadership, you just have to make what you feel like is the, the best decision and, and go with that. Uh, I feel like June the 14th is the best decision for us. And so that's when we'll start meeting live. Listen, we have a lot to do between now and then. We have a company that's going to come in and clean the building and we have a, a lot to get done. And uh, so we're going to be trying to, to connect again with volunteers and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so we're going to need your help. We're going to need a lot of help to, to reopen the church. And uh, so if you're willing and you're able, uh, we sure would appreciate uh, your help. Anyway, uh, welcome to Rocky River Church Online. I'm excited about today's service. I'm excited that you're here. God bless you. Now let's get into the service. It's who you are, it's who you are, 
That's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to Yeah. 
Him. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. So, hey, Rocky River Church, and uh, welcome to Rocky River Church Online. And uh, as we get started with today's message, let me just say that I love you guys and I miss you. And uh, I look forward to being able to see you live and in person very soon. I have a lot to say today, a lot to teach you, a lot of ground to cover. So I want to get right into today's message. And so if you have a Bible, let me encourage you to open it up or turn it on and go to the Gospel of Matthew. That's the first book in the New Testament. Go to Matthew 25. We're going to look at verses 14 through 30. So that's Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And by the way, if you haven't already, let me encourage you to download your message notes so that you can use those to follow along with me in today's message. Now, before we read and unpack Matthew 25, 14 through 30, let, let me give you a little bit of the context here. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells three stories or three parables to answer a question that his disciples actually asked about in Matthew 24. That they wanted to know when the end of time would come. When would it happen and what would it look like? What would it be like? In fact, if uh, you watched last week's message, uh, then you know that last week we talked about the end of times. So the disciples have these questions and Jesus gives them some, some very specific details about what the end times would be like. And, and they're struggling to understand it. And, and, and I get that because, you know, it's, it's not easy to understand. And so Jesus knows that they're struggling with it. And so to try to explain it further to him, he told three stories or three parables to describe what the end would be like. The first story he told was the parable of the virgins. The second story was the parable of the talents. And the third story was the parable of the sheep and goats. Now, the meaning of the parable of the virgins is don't miss the party. By the way, at the end of Matthew 24, Jesus is not only describing what the end time would be like, but he's really stressing the fact that they and us should be ready when Jesus returns. So, the first parable, the parable of the virgins, is about not missing the party. The parable of the talents is about not wasting your life. And then the meaning of the parable of the sheep and the goats is don't neglect helping those who are vulnerable, those who are helpless and in need. In other words, it, you could think of them like this. Parable number one, depend on the gospel. Parable number two, declare the gospel. Parable number three, demonstrate the gospel. Well, today we're going to talk about the second parable. We're going to talk about the parable of the talents where Jesus teaches us not to waste our lives or any more of our lives. And in fact, the title of today's message is Don't Waste Your Life Now. Before we read Matthew 25, 14 through 30, I, I want to make sure that you're with me. Uh, I, I know that um, when, when you're watching a message from, from your home, you know, whether you're sitting in the living room and, um, and, and watching the message, I talked to a couple of friends here yesterday at our community table, and they, they were telling me sort of their Sunday rituals for how they watch the message and they get their coffee and put the computer on a, a TV tray and, and that's how they watch it. Well, whether you're watching this over coffee or you're sitting on the back deck or even on the beach somewhere watching, who, who knows? There's a lot around to distract you. And I want to make sure that you wi you're with me this morning because this message is so very important. I also want you to know that when I talk about not wasting your life, I'm not just talking about... Um, 
seniors who are graduating from high school or college. And by the way, congratulations to high school seniors and college seniors. But I'm not just talking about teenagers or people in their 20s. I'm talking about people or, or talking to people in, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even beyond. In, in fact, listen, if you have life left in you, which basically means if you're still alive right now, and if you're watching this message, then I'm assuming you're alive. You still have some time. And, and, and whether, relatively speaking, that's a long period of time or a short period of time, don't waste it. Make the most out of the life that you have left. <clears throat> My point is I'm talking to you, okay? I'm talking to you. All right. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. <clears throat> Jesus, again, trying to help his disciples what the end times will be like. And he's encouraging them to be ready, to be prepared. He says, for it, or the end time, is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Now, to say he's going on a journey, he's not taking a week of vacation. He's going to be gone for an extended period of time. And so he leaves this valuable property, these possessions, we'll, uh, these talents. We'll say more about that in a few minutes. But he leaves these with his uh, his servants. Immediately, verse 16, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, that's a good place to say, ooh. So why don't you just say that with me? Ooh, this is, this is bad. This is a bad part of the story. Well, verse 19, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents, so I earned five more talents. Now, this is, this is the person, or, or like the person that you work with, and maybe you, you've had, uh, you know, experience like this where, you know, your boss goes out of town, you know, a week of vacation or whatever, or maybe the person you're a direct report to doesn't work, you know, right in your office, and they just come in periodically, but you've really crushed it. And, and you can't wait for the boss to come back in town so that you can say, hey, boss, how was your trip? Hope everything went great. Why don't you ask me about how my week was? Because, man, I did a great job. I made a big sell or I, I've really done things right. Well, this servant, he's done it right. And he, he can't wait to give this report to his master. So his master said to him in verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant. And there's an exclamation point there. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Well, then the man with two talents also approached. He said, master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. And you, you can just tell, like in, in the tone of the story, and he, he adds some words that the other two uh, didn't add just right up in the beginning. Hey, I, I know how tough you are. I know how big and bad you are. You, you just feel like an excuse is coming, right? 
Master, I know you. You're, you're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, wait on it. It's heavy. You evil, lazy servant. Remember who's telling the story. This is Jesus. Sometimes we just pass off Jesus as just being this, uh, this meek and mild guy who never leans forward in his chair, never gets excited or even upset. That he's the one telling the story. You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with at least some interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him and throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where they will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Quite a story. Quite a story. So listen, from, from this passage, and I, I think there are probably a few more than what I'm going to give you, but I'm going to give you seven principles from this story for how to invest your life, how to make the most of your life, how to maximize your life so that you don't waste it. I, I want to give you these principles to show you how to invest your life and your talents into the kingdom of God. Listen, which has eternal value. All right, here we go. Hopefully you have your message notes downloaded and uh, you're ready to take some notes. And uh, even if you're not taking notes, write this down anyway. You need this. Here's principle number one. Everything we have belongs to God. Say that with me. Everything we have belongs to God. Now say it again, but like you really mean it. Everything we have belongs to God. Listen again to verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his servants or his employees um, and he entrusted his possessions to them. Whose possessions were they? It was the master's, right? It was the master's property. It was his talents. He just entrusted them to the servants while he was away. L listen, you and I, we really own nothing. We, we, we don't. We don't own anything. We didn't bring anything into this world. And, and I can tell you as a pastor, uh, I've been a pastor for going on 24 years now. In fact, June 30th, uh, just in a few weeks, I'll be starting my 24th year as a senior pastor. And uh, during these 24 years or so, I I've probably preached 75 funerals and not one funeral coach had a U-Haul trailer hitched up behind it. You're not gonna take anything with you. God made it. God owns it all. And, and I'm telling you this right up front because everything else that I'm gonna say in today's sermon is based on the fact that God owns everything. You and I just get to use it for maybe 80 or so years. One of the responsibilities that God has given to human beings is the responsibility of managing his stuff. Uh, you, you can see it going all the way back to uh, Adam and Eve in the garden of, of Eden. Wait a minute, did I say that right? Uh, you can see it going all the way back to the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, I think I might have got Eve and Eden uh, mixed up. But Adam was in charge of, of tending and taking care of the garden. Well, you can see the same principle right here. Everything belongs to the master. Everything belongs to God. He simply entrusted to us to manage it for a while. We, we steward the things that he puts under our control. 
All right, principle number two. We all have talents. We all have talents. Verse 15 says, to one, the master gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on his journey. All right, so what is a talent? Well, in Jesus' day, it was a measure of money, usually in silver, and it equaled about 15 years of an average working man's wages. So let that sink in. I mean, we're not talking about a small amount here. This is, this is a weighty amount of money. These talents, these possessions, they're very valuable. Well, I, I believe that today in, in our time that a talent represents money but it also represents anything that God entrusts to us. So a talent could be skills, abilities, spiritual gifts. A, a, a talent could be your, your job, uh, your children. Anything that God has put under our authority, under our responsibility, is considered a talent. But here's an important detail that I just want to make sure you get. Don't, don't, don't miss this. This is about the talents. We all have some. All of us. You have talent. I have talent. We all have some talents. And every person has at least one talent. The Bible says in Romans 12, 6, in His grace, and, and let me just tell you that Everything we have, everything that God has given us has put under our control, under our authority to steward is a, a gift of grace from God. Well, in His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. That means that we all have a gift. We all have talents. We all have abilities we all have life experiences. We all have a certain personality trait or, or temperaments. And all of these things together make you, you. There's nobody else on this planet Earth that is quite like you. You've got talent. All right, here's principle number three. Still with me? Still with me? Okay. God expects us to use our talents. So everything we have, all the talents we have, it all belongs to God. All of us have some. And then God expects us to use what he's given us. He expects us to use what he's entrusted to us. God has invested in you. God has invested in me. And he, uh, he expects a return on his investment. Listen again to verse 19. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The Bible says that one day, God's going to audit your life. Now think about that. One of these days, God is going to take an accounting of your life. And I want you to feel the heaviness of this because Jesus wants us to. I think Jesus wants his disciples, you know, when he first tells them this parable, I think he wants them to feel the weightiness of this because again, he's telling them about the end of times and he's telling them to be ready when it happens. And we're only closer to the end of times, you know, here 2,000 years, at least almost 2,000 years uh, after Jesus said these things, we're only closer. So it's more urgent now than ever that we realize that one day we are going to stand before God and give an accounting of our lives. And he's going to ask us, what have you done with what I've given you? And so that should be on your mind right now. It should be on, on the back of your mind, not, not to scare you, but to wake you up. What if today you stood before God and he asked you this day, what have you done with the talents that I've given you? Would you be like the, the, the servant who 
turned five talents into ten and the one who took two talents and turned it into four? Or or would you have to be afraid before God? Would you have to cower before him? Would would you be um, disappointed in the report that you have to give him? Well, Well, listen, we're all accountable to God for how we live our life. We're all accountable to God for what we do with the talents that he's given us. Listen, parents, parents, one of these days, you're going to have to give an accounting for how you've raised your children. Raise them right. If, if they won't answer you, if they won't mind you when they're little kids, they're not going to remind, uh, or they're not going to mind any of us when they're adults. You have to train them. You have to raise them up in the way that they should go. Make sure they're in church. Make sure that they're learning about the Lord. I'll, I'll never forget, year, years ago, I had a, a guy come to me. And he's a guy that I, I knew pretty well. And um, he said, I, I need you to talk to my son. Now, they didn't live in town, and so it wasn't really easy for me to talk to a son. But he said, I, I need you to talk to him or, or just give me some advice on how to deal with him. I said, well, what, you know, what's going on? He said, well, we were having a conversation the other night and he told us that he doesn't believe in God. And he said, Jimmy, I don't know how he could come up with that, that he doesn't believe in God. I believe in God. His mother believes in God. We've been to church. I don't, I don't know why he would grow up and, and not believe in God. I said, well, let, let's just back up. Let, let's talk about, you know, where you guys grew, you know, where, where you went to church when he was growing up and what sort of things was he involved in. And he said, well, we, we stopped going to church right after we got married. And so we, we never went to church very regularly with him. We went some for Easter and some for Christmas. We were involved in a few things along the way, but we, we didn't take him to church. I said, so, okay, did you, did you talk to him about God? He said, well, not really. We just wanted him to be able to make up his own mind about God. I said, then Mike, and his name wasn't Mike. I said, well, that's exactly what he's done. He's made up his own mind, or actually somebody else has made up his mind for him. He, he doesn't believe in God. And, and, I, and I, I told him what he should do from here going forward, but I reminded him, and I'm reminding you, that it was his responsibility to steward that child. It was his responsibility to take him to church. It was his responsibility to take him uh, to church so that he could know the Lord. It was his responsibility to steward that child and tell him about his own faith in God. We're going to give an accounting for our talents, not just our money, not just our skills, but everything that God has placed under our authority. Okay, here's principle number four. It's wrong to bury our talents. It's wrong. Don't don't do it. The the first man took his five talents, doubled it. Second man took two talents and doubled it. But the real story, the real story is in the third man who took the talent, dug a hole, and hid his master's money. And we've already read the reaction. We, We know what that reaction is. He He doesn't just pass this off. He doesn't just pat him on the head and say, well, you know, there's always next time. Instead, he says, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew these things about me, if if you knew I was going to take a strict accounting, if you knew I was going to hold you accountable for this, you should have at least done the minimum. You should have taken the talent I gave you and put it in the bank so that I could earn some interest on it, but instead you buried it. He buried that talent the same way many of us live our lives. We just sit on our lives. We just sit on our life. We, we hide our talent. We play it safe with our lives. You know, every day, as long as my children, you know, well, let me say it this way. Ever since my children have been born, I prayed for their safety every day. But I have to tell you that I never prayed that they would have safe lives. 
I don't want them to do something foolish that gets them hurt or killed. But I don't want them to be safe. I don't want them to live safe lives. I don't think God expects any of us to live a safe, only comfortable life. See, this man's sin, it was passivity. This man's sin is, he didn't want to take any risk. His sin is not that he tried and failed. It was that he failed to try at all. He didn't do anything. Here's my point. You can't please God playing it safe with your life and your talents. The men who invested their talents, they took risks. That's what God is looking for us to do with our lives and with our talents. Why? Because when you take risk, and, and, and listen, listen. I know that playing it safe and taking risks, you know, those terms are relative and and they mean different things for different people. You know, some people are entrepreneurs and business starters and other people are are not. So, you know, risk and reward, those sorts of things, that looks different for, for different people. But no matter what that level is in your life, when you take a risk, You have to have faith. You have to have faith in God. And when we take risks in faith, that's what pleases God. And in fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God playing it safe because you can play your life safe without God. If you're just going to play it safe and sit on the sidelines and ride out the clock on your life, you, you don't need him. And I believe what I'm about to tell you. I believe it with all my heart. And I believe it from this story right here. I believe that God would rather you trust him and have faith in him and take some risks and fail than for you to just bury your life. So maybe you don't fail per se or or it's not what you would call a failure. But you didn't do anything exciting either. You didn't do anything worthwhile. And that's really no way to live. You know why a lot of people just sit on their talents and never do anything with them? Well, I think there are several reasons, but I think one of the big reasons is that most of us sit on our talents because we're not all 10 talent people. In fact, most of us are just one talent people. So our thinking goes something like this. I'm not a superstar, so I'm not going to do anything. My one talent, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to, I'm going to leave the risk taking. I'm, I'm going to leave the adventurous stuff up to the 10 talent guys, the, the pros. I'm just going to let them take care of it. And I see this all the time. I see dull Christians who have lost their edge, if they ever had an edge at all. Their spiritual life has gone flat. They have no joy because their relationship with Christ has become more about a routine or, or meaningless ritual than it is a relationship. And why? Because for the most part, they just sit on the sidelines. They, they've buried their talent. They don't know the joy in giving because they never give. They don't know the joy in serving because they, they never take the risk of serving. They don't use what they have and they don't even try. L- listen to me. Don't bury your life. Make, make your life count. D- don't bury your talent. Invest your talent in the kingdom of God. Here's principle number five. Fear keeps us from using our talents. Fear keeps us from using our talents. Fear is the enemy of faith. Again, the man that received the one talent, he said, hey, I know who this guy is. I know who my boss is. I know who my master is. And and, uh, I don't want to mess up, so I'm not going to try. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to play it safe and he acted or he didn't act at all depending on how you look at it out of fear fear paralyzes us listen some of us are stuck right now can't go forward can't go back can't move sideways we're just paralyzed 
because of fear. And so what, what do you have to do when you're stuck? And you're, you're afraid to take risk. You're, you're afraid to have faith. So you have to tell people something. You just make up excuses. I think fear is one of Satan's favorite tactics to just keep us where we are and, and you know, keep us from doing anything exciting, adventurous, something that we can be proud of, like the people who took their talent and invested it and were happy to say to the master, you gave me this and look what I did with it. He uses fear to just keep us from exercising our faith. Sometimes he does it by creating self-doubt. He, he just causes us to, to doubt ourselves, doubt what, what we're hearing, to, to, to doubt what we see in ourselves, to doubt what we can do. And so we say things like, oh, I, I could never do that. Or, or what if I did that and, and in the end of it, it doesn't work out and I just look like I've done something stupid for God. Then sometimes he uses fear to cause us to have self-pity. You know, to feel sorry for ourselves. And I found myself making some of these statements myself. So I, I know how this goes. We start to say things like, well, I, I've tried this and, and I failed. Or I failed so many times before and I, I'm afraid that if I, I try this again, it's just gonna be one more failure to throw up on the, the pile of failures. Or sometimes you'll hear people say, well, uh, I got involved in a church once and, and I got burned, so I'm not going to do that again. Or uh, I helped out in, in a church ministry before and I got burned out and boy, I'm never going to do that again. So we just sit on the sidelines. We don't get in the game. We just let fear, the fear of getting hurt, the fear of being burnt, keep us from from living out faith. Don't, don't live that way. Get, get over it. Get over your past mistakes. Get over your past failures. Get over that time that you got burned or you got hurt at church. And by the way, I, I'm amazed that from time to time, I'll, well, I say from time to time, but it happens more than, um, than you might realize. But I'll have someone say to me, well, you know, I tried to go to church or I went to church one time and they were mean to me and I'm never going back. Well, have you ever been to a restaurant before? And I know for most of us, it's been a while since we've been able to actually go in, inside a restaurant. But have you ever been to a restaurant where you had a bad experience? Sure you have. Well, did you stop going to restaurants? No. So don't go back to that restaurant. Go find another one. If you got hurt in that church, you had a bad experience there, somebody looked at you the wrong way because you're not wearing the right clothes, then whatever. Just go somewhere else. Get over it. And let me remind you, Jesus wants us to know that the time is getting closer and closer to the end. All right, here's principle number six. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And this is true with anything in your life. If you, if you don't use your talent, you'll lose it. If you don't use your time, your energy, your muscles, your skills, your ability, even your mind, you'll lose it. It's a, it's a universal truth right here. And all of us know it. We instinctively know it. That if we don't use the talent we have, then it just goes away. In, in our story, in verses 28 and 29, the, the master said, apparently there were others standing around, take the one talent that my servant, the evil, lazy one, take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 because the one who has much more will be given. 
And to the one who has nothing, even what he has is going to be taken away from him. And this may not seem fair, but it's just the way it is. And think about it this way. God has the right to take anything away from us uh, if we don't use it for him. He gave it to us in the first place. So if we don't use it, we lose it. If I don't practice my talent, I'm going to lose it. If I don't take advantage of my opportunities, the opportunities that he's given me, then I lose them. Now listen, there's another side to this as well. The other side to this is that whatever you need more of in your life, start giving it to God and he will multiply it. So if you need more time, Start giving him your time. Start managing your time better. Be a better steward of your time. If you need more energy, maximize the way you use energy. Stop wasting so much energy on things that don't matter. If you need more money, then give your money to him. Trust Him with your finances. If you need more talent, give Him the talents that you have. God multiplies things. And let me tell you something, folks. One of the, one of the best, and I would even say one of, one of the easiest areas to measure this in uh, is in the area of finances. So at Rocky River Church, we talk about tithing. We talk, we talk about giving. A tithe is 10%. So if you made $500 this week, your tithe is $50. But I've heard people say, you know, many times over the years, well, Jimmy, I'm new to church. Or I'm, I'm new to giving. I'm, I'm new to this tithing thing. So I, I don't have room in my budget to start giving a tithe. Well, I'm not trying to be a heretic here. But, but for a minute, for, for, for now at least, let's just set the, the tithe part, the 10% part to the side. Start trusting God with what you have. So if you don't have $50, your tithe is $50, you don't have $50, what do you have? Is it $25? Is it $10? Is it $5? Take the little that you do have and say, God, this is what I have. I, I, I don't have much money and I don't have a lot of faith, but I want to have faith. And by faith, I'm going to trust you with this. And then see what God does with that. Because I think that God will honor even those baby steps. I, I think this is true with all of our talents, with, with every area of our lives, everything he puts under our uh, authority to steward or to manage. And, and that includes our faith. The, the Bible says that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move that mountain that stands in front of you right now. So just start with what you have. The truth is that when it comes to financial things, most of you watching right now could start with the tithe. So get started. Just get started and, and say, God, I need you to grow my faith. And, and let me see how you provide. When it comes to the area of giving, the tithe is the only place, at least that I can find, in all of the scriptures where God says, put me to the test. If you'll make sure that my house has what it needs, I'll make sure that you can't build enough barns to store up the blessings that I pour back into your life. Now, I don't think that means that if you give $50 today, God's going to give you $100 tomorrow. But I can promise you this from God's word, that if you'll put his house first, if you make sure you honor and steward uh, or honor him with what you have and steward what you have well for him that he'll make sure that your needs are met. And he says, if you don't believe that, then try me. Today, I want to challenge you to try him. Exercise your faith. Well, there's one more principle. This is principle number seven. And it says that God rewards me for using my talents. 
Listen, there's a reward coming. There's a reward for stewarding well what God has given to us. The rewards, I believe, are why we're here on earth. I think this life is a test. Listen again to verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. And I don't think the joy, we store up our treasures in heaven. What we invest in the kingdom today is an investment into our eternity and in the eternity of others. And the rewards come in three different ways. The first one is affirmation. Affirmation. Everyone needs affirmation. Can can you imagine Jesus saying, great job, Mike. Great job, Sarah. Great job, Doug and Vicky. Great job, way to go. Good job, Jimmy. You really tried. You know, that just feels good. It sounds good. God has a way of affirming us in, in reward. The second reward is promotion. Our reward for faithfulness is more responsibility. When you're faithful over the little things, God gives you more. See, God doesn't give some of us more. um, Well, what's the best way of saying this? God doesn't give you more until you demonstrate you can handle more. I always laugh, and some of you have probably heard me say this before. I always laugh when somebody says to me, Preacher, Powerball lottery is $480 million. If I pick the right three numbers, going to give the Lord $48 million. Going to tithe it right here at the church. And what I, what I want to say is, come on, you make $500 a week. And God can't trust you to give him 50. Do you really expect God or anybody else to believe that if you hit the Powerball lottery for 480 million, you're going to write him a check for 48 million? It, it, first of all, God's not in the lottery. But I don't think things work like that. I don't think you can say, God, if you'll just give me more, then I'll start being more faithful. No, you start being faithful with what you have right now. And then he promotes, he gives more as we show we can handle more. But here's the third reward, it's celebration. It's celebration. The master said, share your master's joy. He says, let's party, let's have a celebration. And I can tell you right now that the happiest people I know are not the ones with bigger, better stuff. The happiest people I know are the people who are using what they have right now for God. Now, sometimes that's the people with bigger, better stuff, but not necessarily. The happiest people that I see are the people who are using what they have to honor the Lord. I want to end by reminding you that the end is coming. The day is coming coming when Master Jesus will return and he's going to do an audit. He's going to bring an end to this age and every person is going to stand before him and give an accounting of our lives. The book's on your life, on my life, are going to be opened up. And it's either going to be a happy experience or it's going to be a horrible one. What what are you going to say? Are you going to make excuses and try to explain how you buried your talent? Will you have to be honest to him and say things like, I've been living for myself, so I buried my life? Don't live that way. Just a couple more things here in closing.
when the master gave out the talents, they immediately, Jesus uses that word, immediately, they immediately left to go and do what they were going to do with the talent. The, the one with the five went immediately and invested it and made five more talents. The one with two immediately went out and he made some investments, doubled his talents. I think our God is an act right now kind of God. He's not a God who procrastinates. And I don't think he wants his people to procrastinate. So Jimmy, what are, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you that some of you know exactly what God wants you to do with your life. You know what the next steps are. You know what the decision is that needs to be made. You, you know what God is telling you to do. But you've, you've delayed that. You know, delayed obedience is disobedience. So for some of you, your next step today is to to stop putting it off. Look, if you know what the Lord wants you to do, then it's time to do it, whatever that is. If you know it's the Lord speaking to you, then you get after it. You go and do it. Some of you need to go get a shovel and go back to wherever it is that you buried your talent, dig it up and put it in play, to act on it, to, to put that into play for the kingdom of God, to invest that. I don't, I don't know what that is that you need to dig up. I, I don't know what the talent is. I don't know what the skill is or the ability or I don't know what that is, but you need to dig it up and start using it for God's kingdom. And then I want to remind you that there's an urgency to all of this. The, the last few days, and I, I know I'm stretching this message out a little bit, and I, I apologize for that, but over the last few days, Karen and I took, um, took a trip down to Southport, North Carolina, down along the North Carolina coast. There's a place there that means a lot to me. It's uh, Fort Caswell down at Oak Island, um, I had what I would call my burning bush experience with the Lord there to start Rocky River Church. And it's kind of a long story, so I, I won't get into it. But we, we went on, on this little trip just to have some time together, but also to spend some time with the Lord and to pray and just sort of get away from things so that we could really hear from the Lord about when to open up the church and next steps. And we feel like some things at Rocky River need to be relaunched. And I... I just, needed to, I just needed to go back there. I, I think some spaces are sacred. Well, Hatch Auditorium is a sacred space for me. <clears throat> Actually, the, the walk between Hatch and the conference center. It's where I had my burning bush experience to plant Rocky River Church. Because people needed a church um, where they could be loved and accepted. Um, a church that wouldn't necessarily be for anyone, but a church that anyone could come to. A church that's committed to preaching the gospel, teaching the Bible, loving people, doing whatever is necessary to, to reach people with the gospel so long as it doesn't contradict the truth of Scripture. I just needed to go there and be reminded of that. And I really felt the urgency there, you know, that the clock is running down. We're closer and closer to the end of times. And if nothing else, I'm getting closer and closer to the end of my own time. I just heard God saying to me, don't waste your life. Don't waste any more of your life. Don't, don't waste the next 10 years. Don't, don't waste the next 20 years of your life and feel the urgency of the moment that people need 
Jesus. So Christian brother and sister, let, let me remind you that the end of the age is coming to a close. And what people need is not just cute Facebook memes. They don't need more talking heads to try to shift the news around to spin things and sort of tailor it toward our own presidential candidate or our own party. People need the gospel. They need good news. And they're open to it. And especially Rocky River Church, I want you to feel the urgency and the weightiness of what we do. You know, these guys went immediately and got to work. And then think about the one talent that was given to the servant with 10 talents. Giving him that talent was like saying, hey, this is not a reward, me just giving you more. This is a reminder to get to work. It's a reminder that we have so much work left to do that we have to keep investing these talents. We have to keep them going, keep them growing. At Rocky River Church, we have work to do. You've heard me say it before, but maybe not for a while now. Our goal should be that not one more person go to hell from Cabarrus County. That's the way I'm living. I want you to live that way too. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truthfulness of it. Thank you that it sometimes makes us uncomfortable. And Lord, I I pray today that we would feel the heat. People don't normally do what they should do. They they do what needs to be done once they feel the heat or feel the pressure. Lord, I, I pray that we would feel the nearness of the coming of the Lord the the nearness of the end of the age, and it would remind us of the importance of the work that we do. And Lord, just realizing that you're coming back again and how we live or how we don't live is determined by what we believe about the end of the age. And, And if we'll live with the end in mind, realizing that you're coming back, it'll change a lot of the the drama that we experience from day to day. It'll take some of the worries away from us that may seem so important uh, outside of the context that Jesus is going to come back and those who don't know him as Lord and Savior are going to be lost for eternity and damned to a sinner's hell. Lord, I pray for Rocky River Church. I pray that we would feel the sense of urgency. I pray for that person who's struggling right now because they know what you want them to do and they've just been waiting. They've just been procrastinating. They've just been sitting on their talent, sitting on their life. Lord, give them the courage that they need to act to go out immediately and begin doing what you have called them to do. And then, Lord, the person who's buried their talent they got to go dig it up. It's going to take some work to do that. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort and energy. But God, I pray that you would bless it. And now, Lord, I want to pray for those who are listening right now who've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But they know that they need Jesus. And they need to surrender their life to Him right now because... The first step in not wasting your life, the first step in investing your life into things, into uh, things that matter, into eternity, is to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if this is you, I want to invite you to pray with me right now and just say, Jesus, in the best way I know how, I give you my life. Now say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I ask that today, May 31st, 2020, would be the start date where I begin following you for the rest of my life on into eternity. 
I pray that you would fill me up with the power of your Holy Spirit so that I can start living every day for the rest of my life, learning more about you and what it means to follow you. I want to be on this journey of following Jesus. I want to know the adventure of that. I don't want to waste my life. And now just say, Jesus, thank you for loving me and saving me. It's in your great name that we pray. And those who agreed said, amen. I love you guys. I look forward to seeing you very soon. God bless you. If you want to respond to Pastor Jimmy's message today, please do so by using the connection card right above this feed. If you want to give to Rocky River Church today, please click on the word give right next to the connection card or utilize our text to tithe feature by texting the word tithe and the amount that you want to give to 980-247-6585. Rocky River Church, thank you for connecting with us today. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday.